Um, good morning and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this live webinar uh, we'll be, we'll, we, where we will be exploring how family hubs can improve the lives of children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities and those around them. So good that so many of you can join us today. So my name is Julie Greer and I'm the Policy and Practice Advisor for Special Educational Needs and Disabilities at the National Centre for Family Hubs here at the Anna Freud Centre. This is a busy day for so many of our guests who will be welcoming the launch of the Green Paper today. The long-awaited SEND review in the form of a Green Paper is an important opportunity to respond to the government's consultation on SEND reform. So it's serendipitous that this is also the day that we are launching the latest module in our Family Hubs Implementation Toolkit, putting families with children with special educational needs and disabilities at the heart of Family Hub planning. Have a look at our implementation toolkit module, putting families with children with special educational needs and disabilities at the heart of family hub planning, and we'll put a link into the chat there for you. So the module has been written as a co-production with parents, carers and young people, some of whom are with us today as well, as well as professionals who already work uh, to make a difference to those with special educational needs and disabilities. So just briefly, for anyone who is joining us today for the first time, the National Centre for Family Hubs is an online resource hub and learning network which has been funded by the Department for Education and is being led by the Anna Freud Centre, the UK's leading evidence-based children and families mental health charity. The National Centre is designed to support the development of family hubs and to spread best practice across England, taking into account what families say they want and need and what providers tell us about best practice and of course what we know from evidence about what works. Today's webinar is part of a rolling programme of learning events hosted by the National Centre and recordings and resources from all of our previous events are available on our website and again we'll put a, a link to previous events in the chat. We also have a number of other learning events coming up over the coming months. This afternoon the DFE Family Hubs Growing Up Well project team will be hosting a webinar to provide information about the next expression of interest opportunity for their digital innovation project. Next month, we have a free bite-sized training session for everyone developing or working in family hubs on AMBIT, adaptive mentalization-based integrative treatment and whole family working. And for colleagues in London, the next community of practice meeting will be happening face-to-face -face at London councils in June. And I know that there are also events around the country as well in the regions um, through communities of practice uh, and encouraging visits as well to local family hubs. And you can now book onto our next national conference, which will be taking place in July. So you can book your place for all these events via our website and we'll share a link to the booking page in the chat now. You can also join our Family Hubs in Mind Learning Network to receive our newsletter where we'll share details of future learning events and other useful resources. So if we can uh, move to uh, the uh, excellent, the agenda. So you can see we've got a really packed agenda this morning, so I need to be quite tight on time here as well. But we're so pleased to be able to uh, have a, a colleague here, Janet Collins from the DfE. I'm delighted that Margaret Mulholland can be here with us. Um, Dominie Long from uh, Baymed uh, in Bristol. She's a deputy head in a, a Bristol uh, secondary school. Colin James, who's a, a parent and does some amazing work, who's going to be telling you about as well. Elizabeth Fricker, you may follow her on Missing the Mark and Michael Kemp, who's joining us, um, although poorly, bless him. So I'm really pleased that you can be with us uh, here today from Rochdale. Um, and then we will be having a speaker panel as well. Um, so do, do uh, hopefully enjoy the morning. The chat function is disabled, but please do submit any questions or comments via the Q&A function. And there'll be an opportunity to ask questions following the presentations. So if you have questions or comments, anything we don't get to today, we will collate as a list of frequently asked questions and we'll make those available on our website. Uh, we would encourage our speakers to answer any questions they can respond to once their presentation is finished as well, and then we'll bring others to the Q&A. The session will be recorded and will be available to watch back on the NCFH website in the coming weeks, and all slides uh, that we have permission for will be sent in a follow-up email to delegates after the webinar and shared via our website. Closed captions are enabled for this webinar. If you'd like to uh, these to be enabled, please click on the closed captions button at the bottom of the screen. So next slide, please. 
So why are family hubs important to families with one or more children with SEND? And I know that there's, there's quite a number of statistics as well in, in coming up in the green paper as well that you'll be able to have a look at today. But certainly we know that around 16% of all school pupils were identified with special educational needs. Um, and if you, over time, it's been worked out that around a third, well, over a third of pupils um, by year 11 have had an identified need at some point in their educational journey. And our point really for this is that it's so important that special needs are, are um, encapsulated, are built into our family hub planning because family hub staff, those who work within the family hubs, out of the family hubs, will be working with families in which one or more children have SEND every day throughout the year and so it's absolutely vital um, that we, we make sure that we can support through the National Centre, uh, local authorities and uh, their commissioned services to uh, ensure that their family hubs are, are absolutely SEND ready. Next slide please. So just, and obviously this is a, quite a crude sort of um, uh, example of those statistics, but it is quite helpful to see, I think, um, so that you're really looking at that in an average class of, of 30. Um, and the next slide, please. And this is something as well that in, in relation to both the SEND review um, and the white paper, um, it's really looking at how do we balance that, that recognition of need and the impact that has on their education. That's, you know, that's what it says in the title, a special educational need. And how do we balance that by, by making adaptations, by doing what we can um, throughout schools, throughout all services at the work with children to, to make a difference? Because at the moment, only one of those average five children uh, will attain in line with peers at the end of Key Stage mm -hmm. 2. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, it's all of those other pressures and we've heard through our co-production as well, and we've really tried to capture that in our paper, so many um, of those pressures that families with one or more children with SEND face. Um, some of these figures you may be um, familiar with, others you won't, and that's why True Family Hubs were working so closely as well with reducing parental conflict, the DWP, for example, Department for Work and Pensions, um, and of course, Best Start for Life as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and here's just encapsulating um, our co-production. I'm really proud of the co-production on this module. Um, and, and it's been really lovely to hear that people can, can hear the voices um, of those with lived experience through the, the work that we've done. It is now live on our website. Uh, next slide, please. So this, I think, really captures it. So what do those with lived experience tell us? Um, and I'll let you, you read those, but it is, of course, really important uh, that we do capture those voices and that you, um, within your family hubs, find ways to answer, um, uh, respond uh, to some of those statements, really, uh, which I think is so important and something that I work through in, in many areas of, of my work, um, that sense of building in not bolting on as well on full send. And I know we've got Margaret Mulholland this morning, who I think coined that phrase as well. So really pleased that uh, she's gonna be with us. So sticking to time, can I just check that we do have Janet uh, Collins with us? I know that she was um, uh, gonna be, oh, sorry, uh, end of those slides. Uh, good morning, Janet, I'm so pleased. I heard that you were traveling um, shortly before you came on today. So I'm absolutely delighted uh, that you can be with us. So uh, Janet Collins, um, is here from the DFE. She is uh, she's responsible for policy for SEND through health and social care as well. So over to you, Janet. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me OK. Um, I have just arrived in the London office of DFE. I'm normally based in Sheffield, um, but it's great to be with you virtually. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of some of the kind of policy work that's been um, delivered by the department currently um, in relation to both SEND uh, and Family Hubs. Um, I think Julie's given us a really helpful introduction there. I am going to touch on the review, don't worry, um, obviously very timely this morning. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide, please. Uh, this is just a summary of the aims overall of the Family Hubs programme, which I'm sure will be familiar to all of you. Um, it's really important that we recognise, as Julie has said, that when we're talking about 
families that might want to access services via family hubs or might have a need to access those services, um, that that offer is fully inclusive of families with a child with SEND. Um, it's also worth noting that some of those families include adults who also have needs of their own. Um, so it's very important that that's kind of fully recognised and understood. And the role of the family hubs in relation to the other systems and processes that those families are engaged with um, is really important and really where there's you know significant potential to improve the experience of families um, who might be navigating send systems and also having more engagement with schools than perhaps a typical family or a family where there is no send present for those children um, so it's really important that we understand that our offer needs to be completely um, thought about um, and I, I love that phrase I'm, I might borrow that and attribute it um, to Margaret if it was indeed Margaret who said that about building it in rather than bolting it on and that should be inherent to all of our SEND systems and processes and services and co-production really is throughout the code of practice. It's really at the heart of the system and um, family hubs have um, a, a role to play um, in further in, in improving that access to services. So if we can skip on, please, to the next slide. Um, so these are the kind of core themes of family hubs, the principles by which all family development, uh, family hubs development uh, should be steered and guided. Um, that you know we've just talked about access we've talked about connection and relationships it's really key that the family hubs um, play a role in supporting families um, and particularly around helping them to navigate the landscape of services and the various offers that they may, may need to um, access in order for their family to thrive i'm not going through all of the bullet points um, but i think the the you can see really clearly how important this will be for families where there is a child with SEND or more than one child. And if we can move on, please. Um, so I wanted to talk particularly about a couple of projects. I will come on to the SEND review in just a moment. But first of all, I wanted to talk about um, our Respite and Short Breaks Innovation Fund, which some of you will be aware of. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so this is a new program which the department has um, recently launched. It's a £30 million fund um, to deliver innovative respite and short breaks offers over the next three financial years. Um, and it's we've we've just uh, we're just in the process of assessing the bids and finalizing bids so local authorities will hear very very soon in the next week or so um whether a bid has been successful um, but i wanted to speak about this just as an example of an area of policy where bringing the family hubs um together with other services that are available for families of children with send um can really have an impact um so if we could move on to the next slide please um, so this programme, uh, the funding was secured at Spending Review last autumn, um, and the aim of the programme is to support families by wrapping around the educational offer that their child is accessing and to support children um, to stabilise placements where they might be vulnerable um, or at risk and also to learn more about how we can best deliver these services. And there's a real strong focus within that on the integration with other parts of the system and the connection with other services that might be offered to that family. And um, so obviously Family Hubs has a clear role in that. And um, also looking at connections to health and other early help um, services, however they're delivered. Um, and we're wanting to make sure that this program offers an opportunity to look at innovative models of delivery for respite or short breaks um, across a full spectrum of services from the smallest program of, you know, potentially a few hours a week of a non, not particularly specialist uh, provision, perhaps activity based provision, access to childcare facilities, that type of service, all the way through potentially to the most specialist settings and children that need a very high level of specialist support. Um, but we what we are evaluating um, the projects that are funded through this programme um, to understand more about how we can best support families and, and one of the things what we're looking for is how well we can smooth that journey in terms of gaining access to services and support that a family might need. So could move on to the next slide please. Um, so just a timeline on this, as I say, some of you will be aware of this already and colleagues or yourselves may have been involved in submitting bids. The bidding window closed on the 6th of March um, and we've been busily assessing bids, um, looking at the criteria around um, for success, including that element of innovation and also the integration of the offer um, and how this offer would meet an unmet need and demonstrate better integration of services and a more joined up offer for families and for children and young people. So over the next week, 
um, applicants will be notified of the outcome. Um, we have got through that process as quickly as we could. We're very keen to um, get grants agreed uh, for those successful areas um, by the beginning of April so that delivery can begin within as soon as possible in the next financial year. Um, the guidance on this programme um, will have set out that this is starting small. So although it's 30 million over three years, in the first year, we're only expecting to spend around about 5 million of that money um, because we've had quite constrained timescales. So we will be um, offering further opportunities for local areas to bid. So if you have bid and you were not successful in this round, there will be a further opportunity um, and we will provide feedback on all of the bids so that areas can position themselves um, for the best chance of success in future years. Um, okay, so if we can move on to the next slide. I'm going to touch now on the send review. I'm aware that this is extremely whistle stop because um, I've only got 10 minutes and I want to leave time um, for any immediate questions, although I'm not promising I'll be able to answer them all, particularly on the review. Um, but as most of you will be aware, uh, the government has been carrying out um, a review of the send and alternative provision system in England, which has been underway since late in 2019. Um, and its publication is today. Um, so we are exactly timely with this particular webinar. Um, so the review has gathered over that time period, there has been some disruption within that time period due to COVID, um, but there has been a huge amount of work done to gain um, evidence and to hear from a huge range of stakeholders, including parents, carers, children and young people themselves, and a wide range of professionals. So a large amount of evidence has been gathered and today the review is published in the form of a green paper, which will now be open for consultation. So if we could just see the next slide, please. Um, this slide sets out some of the background, um, some of which Julie's already covered in terms of the, the data on um, the numbers of children with SEND. Um, the review was instigated in response to a kind of growing concerns about challenges facing the system, um, including some reports from the National Audit Office and the Education Select Committee, um, recognising that the system was struggling to deliver the outcomes that we would want for all of our children and young people with SEND. Um, and also that financial sustainability was extremely challenging and becoming more so over time. Um, so this slide just sets out some of the kind of principles of the review. Um, and as I say, today it will be published as a green paper, which will be laid in Parliament this morning um, and then uh, published. And um, that information will obviously be available for everyone. Um, and that starts, launches a 13 week consultation starting today, which will close on the 1st of July. Um, and there will be lots of opportunities to engage, um, including via representative organisations such as the LGA um, and the Association of Directors of Children's Services. There'll be lots of um, events um, and opportunities, consultation events around the country. Um, and we are aiming to reach as wide an audience as possible um, with those events um, to gather people's feedback on the proposals that the review sets out. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So in terms of principles, thanks, Julie. Um, I think this is the last or last but one. Um, so you can see that what the review is aiming to deliver is um, a system which provides the right support at, in the right place at the right time for all children and young people with SEND. And that will stretch across those that are in mainstream provision, those that are accessing specialist placements and those in, a, in alternative provision. And the role of alternative provision has really been brought into the review because it's so apparent that there's significant crossover with the cohort excuse me, with around about 80% of young children and young people who attend alternative provision having an identified SEND need. So it's absolutely vital that the um, proposals that the review sets out take account of that provision and that cohort of children and young people um, and make sure that the system works for them as well. Um, so the slide there sets out some of the core aims of the review. I won't go through it in endless depth. You will obviously have the opportunity to read the published full green paper when it appears online later today. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into that in detail now, um, but it's really important that um, as we look at uh, how do we address needs across all types of setting and for that children and young people across that full range of needs, 
the importance of the services that wrap around that child and family are absolutely crucial to the success of this. Um, so it is very obviously very important that education settings deliver um, you know, really high quality provision and provide the right support in the right time. But it's also important that we look beyond what happens in that education setting and understand the child's needs in a really holistic way and understand the needs of their family as well. The principles of the SEND system that already exist, but we want to make them work better around things like telling your story once and having one um, full assessment, which covers all of your needs, um, not having to constantly repeat um, the background and the history of your child's experience to different professionals. Family hubs have a really important role to play in, in improving that. Um, and, and I think it's really important, therefore, that the review and the family hubs development are seen as kind of two developments in tandem, which together have the potential to really improve the experience as well as the outcomes of children and families that are engaging with these systems. So I hope that's a hope, helpful overview. I apologize for the fact that it has been extremely rapid. I'm really happy to take questions offline. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to stay for the duration of this morning, um, but I'm happy to pick up any questions that you want to add into the Q&A. And I'm sure that Julie and the team will forward those on to me and make sure we can get answers out to you. Thank you very much. Janet, thank you so much for joining us on such a busy day as well. And, and really great that you are, have been able to share some of the, the key messages from the Green Paper as well. I think the, the important bit is that it is a consultation that people need to really you know, go through it and take that opportunity. Just a couple of cons, uh, questions that have come up. Um, uh, in particular, will there be a specific consultation with early years? Do you want to just respond to that quickly? Um, yeah, as far as I understand it, there are planned events with a whole range of representative bodies across the full range of provider types, um, but there are also opportunities for either individuals or organisations to respond to the online consultation and there will be a published form. As I just noticed, the second question is about the link. I don't have the link yet. I don't think it's live yet, um, but it will be on gov.uk. And as soon as we've got that link, I'll forward it on to colleagues at the Anna Freud Centre to circulate to members of this webinar um, so there will be a form there where you can add your comments um, as well as opportunities um, and obviously once we've got that schedule of events that will be publicized um, but if there's a particular organization that members feel we need to make sure we've covered please let um, you know add that into the to your comment um, and I'll feed that back to the team that are organizing all the events um, that's yeah, great. thank you, Janet. And actually, Emily Ingle from the DWP has just posted the link. So we understand it is current. It went live oh, brilliant. Okay. Minutes ago, so um, 20 minutes ago. So that's great. Thank you very much, Emily, as well. Again, you know, safe to oh, no, well, have a, a good rest of day. Uh, I'm sure it's busy. Um, and thank you very much again for, for joining us. And hopefully you'll be, get a chance to look at the, um, uh, the uh, video of the uh, rest of the conference later on. Thank so, you very much. Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure now to, to welcome Margaret Marholland. Um, I, I will have to check. Was bolt on, built on, not bolt on yours? <laughs> built in, not bolt on. I'm, I'm sure many, many people uh, use that phrase, but Nathan very kindly attributed it back to me um, as and it's sure one of their core principles. Sure. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's just an easy way for us to remember some of the ambitions that we have for the system. And that I'll, I'll reference that now when we we talk a little bit more about it, which is great. Lovely. So, so welcome, um, Margaret. You do so many things, um, but you're here in particular as a ascend and inclusion specialist um, on behalf of ASCOL. So, so welcome this morning. I'm aware we're slipping time, but we do have one of our um, guests who sadly can't be with us today. So, we've got a little bit of bit of slippage time. So, um, I'll hand it over to you, and I'll let you know when your ten minutes is is coming to an end. Off you go. Thank you very much, and and um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and uh, very excited to start this conversation really around the, the, the family hubs and the role of SEND um, and the position of, of SEND within that. So uh, thank you, Julie. I'm, I'm just going to talk this morning very briefly about both the challenges and the opportunities. I hope you can see my slides. Um, I'm going to keep it quite simple. It, from I'm uh, uh, Margaret Mulholland. I, I'm an inclusion policy specialist with the Association of School and College Leaders. Um, I'm also working with an education endowment foundation trial. So working from 
Cornwall to Carlisle with schools, particularly secondary schools at the moment, who are really grappling with the notion of how best to support young people and their families um, when they present with some form of special educational needs and, and how to spot those invisible disabilities, those emotional issues that young people are increasingly experiencing post pandemic and, and, and really grappling with what's going to best support them to take the next steps and to thrive. Um, ASCAL is, as I say, a leadership union um, and we very much pride ourselves on um, speaking on behalf of our members but actually acting on behalf of young people and that is our ambition and never more so I hope uh, than in relation to those young people with learning difficulties which I'm most passionate about and which I believe our leadership is also passionate about. You may not have seen me before but you may well have seen Jeff Barton who's our general secretary who'll probably be on the news and the radio today talking about yesterday's white paper and today's green paper and how they align to each other and I think it's really important that we articulate our commitment to making sure that the consultation around the green paper is, is really, um, the opportunity is really maximized and that we capture the voices of school leaders and their communities, not just those leaders, but the, the young people that they speak on behalf of and uh, the um, families they, they speak on behalf of. And, and that relationship is not always an easy one, but it's always one that everyone is ambitious for um, to be the most positive it can be. ASCAL has at the moment a manifesto, um, a blueprint for a fairer system. And within that, one of the things that we have said we most wanted to see was the notion that our priority children, those children who most need the support of school, are central to the thinking, the planning, and the delivery of services for education. And um, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it, that we should be saying that's what we'd like to advocate for, because that is what education should be. Um, it should be equitable. Therefore, in being equitable, it needs to champion hardest work most on the behalf of those that find it most difficult to access schooling, um, most difficult to thrive in a classroom. Um, and those are the young people that sometimes need those reasonable adjustments. But unless we're thinking about them front and centre, it's very easy for the provision for those young people to be, as Julie said, bolted on. And, and I often use this um, diagram, and I have done apologies for many years now, um, to really show you know, the school system and where for many years, learners with special educational needs um, have sat, which is on the edges, on the periphery, that actually schooling and the drive, policy drive has often been about the majority and not what was perceived as the minority of young people with SCND. And as Julie, she mentioned before some research from the Education Policy Institute, which talked about the lived experience of young people from the age of um, three through to 16, and how the percentage of young people who at some point have experienced difficulties in engaging with the curriculum, so being on that SEND register has been up to 39%. So we're not talking about a minority here. So this position of consideration for SEND as being something, you know, when we're thinking about school improvement, school culture, professional development in schools, the community that we work with, so predominantly thinking about the family hubs, how important that community partnership is in relation to our young people who are struggling to access our curriculum at the moment. It's really important that we move that position of our thinking to the center. I was opening, um, I was at a school up in Rotherham a few weeks ago and they were, they. They had a, a session after school inviting all the local community who were interested in SEND and the work that they were doing and the support that they were giving to their young people. And they had a sort of market forum and they had the young people championing um, the experiences that they've had at school, talking about the curriculum and how they access it, talking about the additional provision that's in place for them. And they said, 
we have SEND at the heart of our school and they put their resource base at the heart of their school. And they've thought about the community around them, which a developing family hub must be a really important aspect. But we're not just talking about physical centrality for SEND. We have to put SEND children, and I, I, I hate that sort of alignment, I don't mean it like that, it's a way, the phraseology, but ch young people with SEND at the centre of our thinking, not just of our building. And that's the ambition that school leaders have. One of the things I've learned as a policy specialist over the last couple of years is that actually one of the most important things when influencing policy, and which is going to be really important, and I'm aligning this to how I, I, I think the, the family hubs ought to be thinking in, as Janet said, in tandem, in parallel, or in partnership, in co-production, but that, that vision has to be aligned. And um, one of the ways in which we do that is have conceptual models for helping everybody understand what's important and what's going to impact that lived experience. And one of those ecosystem models that has actually made its way into SEND guidance for schools and into safeguarding guidance and creeping into other aspects of provision around ch um, children uh, looked after, though, is this model of Bromfenbrenner, a sort of eco model that doesn't just look at the behaviors of a child when thinking about what, what, what we do to intervene and support next steps for development and learning, but actually looks at the interrelationships and the impact of those relationships, both positive and negative, and how we can use the community to support those relationships to be more positive. So not just intervening to fix the behaviors of a child, which we know can be detrimental in terms of an approach, but actually understanding that holistic picture that Janet referred to. And I think this model now creeping in to the guidance and the policy narratives is something that ASCL is really trying to champion to say, we need consistency. We need behavior policy to take a, um, notice of this. We need attendance policies to take notice. So actually working on a conceptual model together is incredibly important. So I really urge not only schools to build in SEND and have a permeated approach, not a, we have these young people that we cater for in our curriculum, and then we try and do something additional for these other young people. That's a, a move against a separation and othering of young people that schools are really embracing hard and are delighted to see the words inclusion and inclusivity in that green paper front and center. So we need this conceptual model to be something that makes sense to you and it makes sense to the schools and then we can work on collaboratively together. And, and, and another sophistication, if you like, of this eco model is one from Mel Ainsco. Mel Ainsco is a very well known Sen uh, champion and advocate and researcher internationally, and he puts this picture again of the child at the center of their experiences and how you know tackling poverty tackling um tackling aspiration tackling um attachment tackling trauma all those aspects of interplay with the community and the child are really important for schools to understand and we really believe that that is our role in the way in which teachers work in the classroom, one of the things that um, we've been championing and working with Anna Freud on um, in multiple ways is really thinking about this sort of notion of graduated approach. Now, you might think that's a bit sophisticated as it, as it talks about, you know, what teachers do in the classroom and in terms of assessing the child um, of planning for them differently because they've worked out that they're actually, you know, the child who's sitting by the door is not able to focus or the child that's sitting up front is feeling a little bit enclosed and oppressed. Working with understanding small micro adjustments and 
through assessment are really important. But the one reason, minute, Margaret, one minute. Thank more. you. The reason I'm putting this in here is that I think these micro adjustments are things that we can collaborate on together because only understanding the child better and supporting that bigger picture in collaboration with family hubs, are we really going to shift the system for families? And this notion, and I know this from my own experience of having a, a young person with special educational needs, is that often you want to bring together that full audience of collaborators who've worked with your child, who understand them, who need to adjust and tailor and bespoke provision for them. But actually, doing that requires that co-production to be really effective and our visions to be aligned for holistic development and that's where i think working with schools who are really championing inclusion and um, across the piece consistently we can really benefit from collaboration and if you can see there that notion of a school that really does bring together those spokes and uses that not only to influence the emotional experiences within school, the friendships, the peer groups, the mentoring, but also the day-to-day -day practice of the teaching. So we're using the family as a way in which we really develop and appreciate the expertise to recognize the full picture, the holistic picture that the young person brings on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, that the that, that really does count in terms of practice. The pledge, um, the parental pledge that was mentioned yesterday in um, the white paper is really important, but it focuses specifically on literacy and numeracy. Now that's really important, but what we're talking about here is the opportunity to work collaboratively with family hubs to really think about the fuller picture, not just that literacy and numeracy and the raising of attainment, but a much fuller picture. And I'm gonna give you another conceptual model from Linda Darling Hammond, where we're looking at the whole child and the whole um, contribution that knowledge of the whole child makes to their development and their opportunity to thrive. And I think that is that picture that we can work on conceptually together to really make a difference to children and young people with schools that really value the opportunity to work with hubs and to outward face and bring the community in to put send at the center of their thinking. So I look forward to discussing that and the, the green paper with you in the Q&A later. Thanks, Julie. Mm. Margaret, thank you so much. It is always inspirational um, listening to you and, and so much food for thought there. Do put your questions um, into the Q&A so that we can come back to those later. But thank you so much for, for setting us going um, there with our thinking. I'm really, really pleased to be welcoming Domini Lung uh, this morning as well. So as I mentioned, uh, you're a deputy head teacher uh, in the sec big secondary school in Bristol, um, but you also represent the, the Bristol and Southwest um, Black and Asian and Minority Ethnic Educators Group. Um, Baymed, uh, which is, uh, I'm really pleased that you're here with us today. So I will hand over to you. Thank you, Julie. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Julie said, um, I just want to reiterate that I've got 14 years experience of being a senior leader, either in or supporting multiple schools across Bristol. For most of that time, I've been the strategic lead for SEND safeguarding and inclusion in schools with a high percentage of SEND on uh, students on the SEND register. So I'm going to start by talking about a piece of research that the Department of Education at the University of Oxford conducted in 2019. They conducted a comprehensive analysis of the England National Pupil Database to identify ethnic disproportionality in the identification of SEN throughout the period of 2005 to 2016. And the findings show the patterns of ethnic disproportionality are substantial and have been consistent for over a decade. And what they found is that Asian pupils are half as likely to be identified with ASD as white British pupils, whereas Black Caribbean and mixed white and Black Caribbean pupils are twice as likely to be identified with SEMH needs as white British pupils. And Professor Steve Strand, who led the research, said, while ethnic disproportionality for some special needs, like moderate learning difficulties, can be accounted for by socioeconomic background and early attainment or development on entry to school, this research indicates that neither factor explains the ethnic disproportionality in the identification of ASD or SEMH. 
the upshot is that some Asian pupils may not be receiving the access to specialist resources and support they need with ASD, while some Black Caribbean children may be suffering an inappropriate or narrowed curriculum from unwarranted over-identification, particularly in secondary school. The research argues that lower awareness of autism, of parents' rights, linguistic barriers to access and cultural variation in social attitudes to disability have a role in the under-identification of Asian pupils with autism, whereas variation between schools is more influential in the over-representation of Black Caribbean and mixed white and Black Caribbean students at SEMH, particularly in the secondary phase and in high poverty schools, due to differences in school discipline policies, for example. So there are internal school factors involving unconscious bias that are most definitely contributing to this overall disproportionality. But today I want to focus on how we can overcome some of the obstacles that I have experienced in engaging parents and carers from diverse backgrounds that may be contributing to this picture as well. When I first started at my current school, where Somali families are the second largest ethnic group after white British, I met with a community leader, a Somali lady with a child on the autistic spectrum who was undertaking her PhD with Bristol University, researching the underdiagnosis of autism in her community. She shared some preliminary findings with me, suggesting that autism is significantly more prevalent than is diagnosed in the Somali community. She was invaluable in helping me to understand some of the barriers that schools might face in engaging Somali parents with discussing SEND. Her name is Noura Arbi and she went on to found Autism Independence, now a prominent charity in the region. Some of the thinking that my early conversations with her sparked was that as with all school to home engagement, relationship building is the starting point. And this led me to think about deliberately employing staff from the communities we serve in my current school, we created the role of two Somali family support workers who between them personally know and live amongst many of the Somali families we serve. And finding opportunities to visit the communities, for example, the positive responses to the head teacher and myself attending a community theatre production one evening or a community event one Saturday or the funeral of a former student was overwhelming. It breaks down an us and them fear of the inaccessibility of institutions and the leaders of those institutions. And creating different opportunities for communities to come into the school, but finding out what kind of opportunities will result in parents and carers attending and what any obstacles are to that attendance. For example, sometimes a cultural supper event involving food, but in my experience, coffee mornings or afternoons with a clear educational focus hold a lot of appeal. Parents who came to this country to provide their children with a better life are very keen to understand how the education system works and what they can do to help, but they need support to do so. Translators, a creche facility for an hour or two, as it is often mums who attend. And considering the best form of communication is really important. For my current school, all important letters are translated into Somali, which is good, but not enough. Somali only became a written language in the 1970s and their parents who are not able to read and write extensively in what for them has been an oral language for so long. A text message succinctly summarizing the key point is better, but a phone call is best. When we want to ensure high turnout to any event, our Somali family support workers phone home to every Somali parent in the relevant year group. It can take two weeks, but results in 90% plus attendance of our Somali families. We also make videos of key information in Somali and with subtitles. One of our Somali family support workers gave me valuable insight once into cultural differences of communication that were creating an obstacle. He explained to me that the British way of delivering feedback is the sandwich method, negative feedback sandwiched between two positive bits of feedback. He explained to me that this doesn't translate well into Somali culture because both the culture and the way of speaking is much more direct. So the most important information should always come first. He explained that some parents, when at a later date reminded of negative feedback they've been given about their child at parents' evening, for example, had not understood the importance of that feedback the first time around because of the way it had been sandwiched. We use this knowledge to train teachers in how best to engage our Somali parents in conversations at parents' evening. Just give you a couple of specific examples of strategies from my current school. 
So from our regular coffee morning, our Somali parents articulated that they really wanted to understand how the school system works and how they can help their children to improve their learning, but they wanted age specific understanding. So we decided to start with Somali students identified as having low levels of literacy, some due to EAL, but others not in year seven. Our Somali family support worker phoned and personally invited every single one of the 60 plus parents in this cohort and asked what would stop them coming. For some, it was transport. So the Somali family support worker helped facilitate lifts between the parents. For a few, it was the issue of young children. So we ensured that staff were on hand to supervise the young children with toys and games in the corner of the large room where the meeting was held. Our SENCO and our literacy coordinator then spent two hours with parents delivering a workshop explaining how students develop literacy as they learn a language from phonics development all the way to understanding what tier two vocabulary means and providing parents with some age appropriate strategies to support their child's literacy development, even if they themselves lack confidence in the English language. Just one minute. Another example, sorry, sorry, what was that, Julie? Sorry. Sorry, just one minute. Okay, no problem, nearly done, yeah. Another example is a parent whose child was at high risk of permanent exclusion, who was very resistant for a long time to an assessment for ADHD. Understanding the parents' precise fears in order to reassure them was the key. What worked the most was explaining to the parent the science behind ADHD and raising the parents' awareness of highly successful individuals in society with ADHD, such as Bill Gates and Richard Branson, because their greatest fear was that a diagnosis of any kind would limit their child's future. It's really important to push for recruitment of parent or community governors that represent the communities you serve. Again, a barrier is often feeling like they do not understand the education system enough to be a governor. So running sessions like the one I described above is also a good way to try to encourage parents from diverse communities to become governors. My final point is an example of how uninformed assumptions about diverse communities can be really harmful. It's in the all too often mistake that I've seen schools make where a school's fixation on labeling a child as EAL can mask any exploration of possible send Working with all staff to understand when a concern might be more than just a lack of English vocabulary is so important in order not to delay any recognition of SEND needs. Too often I've seen EAL students have their SEND needs only recognised years later once they've achieved a certain level of fluency in English. There does need to be a lot more work done here as a society in understanding how to pick up early SEND needs in students for whom English is an additional language. Um, and that's the end of my, my bit. No, that is absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Dominie. And, and I'm so sorry to rush you. We've got so much to get through this morning, but, but such a wealth of experience. And I think for me, the beauty, hearing the way that you, you speak and all the, the experience that you have is about how transferable that is and the importance of all those messages to carry into our family hubs um, and that relationship between schools and family hubs, as, as Margaret started to um, outline this morning, is, is absolutely vital. So thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure now um, for me to introduce Colin James, who's also from Bristol, from the um, outskirts of Bristol. Um, and Colin is, is a parent, but I'm going to leave you, Colin, to tell us more about um, your, your journey as a father and also as a parent support. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Colin. I was a single dad up until recently in time at new partner of two boys. One has complex need ADHD, missing chromosome, global de development delay and ADD, Attachment Deficit Disorder. I also have a son who I talk about a lot today. He is 15. Um, we've been fighting for EHCP for him since he ate, like year six of school. Um, I'm in the last stages now and he's, good. he's in year 10. My journey with Family Hubs has been very positive. Um, the support I've been offered by Bristol's Families in Focus has been amazing. Start off with it was uh, Webster Stratton program that is early years nowadays to help me to deal with my son's behavior with the because obviously he was ADHD I didn't understand him and I feel that they give me techniques that showed me a different way of parenting him and shown me how to understand him. Prior to that, I then went on to a second course, which is Parent Plus Adolescent Program. That is written by John Sharon in Ireland. And my son's autistic, so I didn't understand my son. He's additional needs. I haven't got 
as many needs as he has. I have um, attachment deficit disorder and I also got a chromosome with him. But I found from Bristol, they were very understanding. They, they, it was never judgmental. It was always actually, okay, yes, you have this. And attending a parenting course for me was quite like disheartening because I thought, well, well, why was I told by professionals I needed this? But actually it was very positive. They give me different sort of strategies to deal with, the pause button, the stop, tune into your children. Because when my son was having a, like, a meltdown, I just thought he was being a, a, like a, a, a naughty child. But in fact, actually, the families and focus team has actually deterred me to actually know he's not naughty. No, I'm not alone. There is a, hundreds and thousands of parents out there that are actually dealing with the same issues as I do. It is a long road, road and it has been over the last five years, it has been up and down. But when I first started working with Families in Focus, I was like, okay, I'll do this course and that's it. Six and a half years on, now I am in the position that I'm actually supporting parents with additional needs. I actually I run my own group that actually offers support for children out there. Um, called It used to be parent parent participation now we, we've changed it to family support because we feel that the families it's not just mums and dads that need the support it's aunties carers guardianships and even, we have professional teachers that come onto our courses now so as a bit of that we actually done because obviously I was sent via cams to do this I actually off my own back with this actually done a leaflet to actually explain that Bristol has a lot to offer and it is a lot of free courses, self referral You don't need professionals to be sending you. So on, on the thing we have, parents think, and on, think, on parents' opinion, it was, I thought I was, ex, you know, I thought it was excellent support with support facilitators who actually know the inside and out. And actually these facilitators actually know what it is like firsthand because they have lived experiences same as we do. Uh, the parent practitioner that, was dealing with my courses. She had children with ADHD and ASD. So they were the clear thought of actually, this is what you need to do and that. So over North Bristol, we have six courses. We have Triple P, MVR is non-violent resistance. We have Incredible Years that used to be called Different and also PPAP for teenagers. And two new ones is Timid to Tiger and P Separated Parents. They are all very good courses. I'm sure there'll be more that I, I sit on. But for me, I think as a parent, now I offer this, I'm now doing a lot of work with Bristol City Council. I've just organised a celebration in the council hall this week, well, last week, to celebrate parents' achievements. We've recruited a parent in this who's actually children's done EHCPs. So she works with all our, our parents that don't understand this. And she's actually built a workshop alongside us to say, actually, this is the road to the EHCP. This is where you can help support them. And it's given techniques that are different. Um, I, I still have a lot of learning to go. I have a daughter who's been a very emotional and traumatic thingy. And I feel that no matter how much I work with the Bristol team, there's always a hand, there's always someone on hand to actually say to me, okay, what about this? What about that? And for me, it's important to have the professional there, but it's actually more important to have a parent there who's actually done and lived through these courses and like support them on the road. Because as a professional, it's okay for some professionals to say you need to do this but actually if you've got a parent that says it there's a bit 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 more hard hitting i had the pleasure to meet john sherry on zoom the other on friday and the aspirations that the gentleman actually told me and the email i received afterwards is actually mr james you've done an amazing job and but actually what took it away from me was You've got so much away from this. And the praise we sat, said to this gentleman was amazing. Just one minute, Colin. Oh, brilliant. You're a superstar. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I love I love your energy. I love the difference that, that you've made, um, you know, within Bristol as well. Um, and such a fabulous rail model. And, and you know, uh, really, really pleased that you could share that with us this morning as well. And, 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 I, and I think a good thing about it is, is it started off, off in North Bristol. Now we're going across to Central and South. And they're all getting parents that actually a parent like myself who sat all this is actually going to go along and do exactly what I do. So speak to CAMS, interview parent uh, working staff. So they get the need. So a panel of five of us sat there and it was very weird how what Bristol City Council was looking for was actually exactly the same as what us as parents were looking for someone to understand our children's needs. And that is very important for me as a parent with children with SEN, especially Absolutely. two of them. No, thank you. Thank you. And, and I think the other thing that you raised um, was how good those parent courses that are, are aimed, I suppose, at parenting carers, but actually the fact that you've got teachers coming along, it's something that we put into the module as well, you know, where family hubs can be, you know, you can you can be integrating that training um, because actually everyone will benefit from it. Definitely. So, yeah, fabulous. Thank you. Thank so you very much. much. Do you join us for the q and I will do. Thank you. So again, I'm, I just feel so excited with, with the people that we have today. I'm, I was delighted to actually meet Eliza in person because I've been following um, Missing the Mark, your, your Twitter feed, for, for some time. Um, Eliza is an author, um, a great Twitter, um, uh, what, are, what does that, a Twitter writer, a Twitter feature? A, twi a Twitterer. <laughs> is that a... Um, so I'm just going to hand over to you. Welcome. Thank you uh so let me just get the screen up there we go so thank you very much for having me here today um my name is Liza Fricker um I'm an illustrator author and mother to an autistic child and I write and illustrate a blog called missing the mark and that is about navigating the education system and autism and much of my work is actually about the systems that we're trying to navigate when we're looking after a child who has extra needs. Uh, here you can see that I've drawn myself laying exhausted under a whiteboard of various departments and systems of support um, that we're attempting to navigate and often being sent to different departments, no one to guide work alongside us to navigate or even marry up the different departments. What we're trying to do while we're exhausted, frazzled and worried is find a way through these various departments for help, consistency of help for our children. With no map, no flow chart of who to go to next, no guide, no idea. And here I am looking for understanding, individualised support, flexibility. And I often say, imagine if we tried to run our lives like the divisions and subdivisions of support systems. So here is myself and my child and my child saying, do you want to watch this with me? And I'm saying, your ASC teacher will be able to advise you on the suitability of that. Mum, can I have a drink, please? I'm sorry, I'm the food prep coordinator. You need the refreshment support service. If you leave a message, Mum, can you get the dog off? It's being annoying. You need to do this through the pug advisory service. We are not able to come in without going through them first. And then you combine this with the phone calls we receive out of the blue when we're not prepared, but desperate to speak to someone and we don't even have a pen. Repeating our child's complete history, re-traumatising and never see them again. Pointless. So consistency and continuity of relationships to help us navigate the system not to have to repeat ourselves over and over and relive difficult experiences, to schedule in a call so we are prepared, so we have a notebook and pen. And this is a drawing I did of myself 
frantically typing emails to whoever I, well, just anyone in the hope someone will get back to me. And I get a generic email saying, we're seeking advice on other items. And then who should call out of the blue? Someone I've never spoken to before. And you can see me cleaning up cat sick while trying to take this call because that's the thing, we're desperate to speak to someone. And then I have to go through the whole of um, what has been going on for us at that time because the person who called didn't know anything about what our situation was, but had obviously been told by someone to give us a call, check in. And they actually, this is a true story. This person did come round. I think they were called a mental health support worker um, and they were linked to the school. And they came around and they did some checklists with me and my child and they left and we never saw them again. And I don't know what the checklists were for. Um, and there's me apologizing to my child because I often felt that was really important, you know, to sort of say, look, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on here either. Um, because over the years, this made me a bit cynical about letting people into our home, our safe space, not because any of them were unkind or unpleasant, but it was disruptive. My child needed safety from relationships that were built up in, invested in, trust. This was what was important to my daughter's well-being. And this is a cartoon I did about myself being a bouncer to our home. This is a low demand household. Generic solutions will not be tolerated. And then here's someone turning up saying, please, I've got a ton of generic checklists and a jolly pencil. I know someone at CAMS. No can do. Your mate came last week and Muggins here had to mop up your mess. And it's funny. Well, not funny, but I drew this analogy because I do like an analogy of eating at a restaurant. Because where else would you experience such service that many families do? And where would that ever be okay? So this is me in a pizza restaurant saying, excuse me, I've been waiting ages to be served. And the waitress is saying, well, why don't you email us your order and we can see if we can get you a table in a few months time. And then there's me saying, this isn't good enough. I waited ages and the order was wrong. Then it was cold. And the waitress is saying, well, you got to come to a restaurant and sit at a table. Plenty of other people need that table. What makes you so special? Or imagine if you're ringing for a takeaway, a delivery, how do they ever get any customers? They never pick up. So I end up just having some pasta pesto. Or it finally arrives and then I'm saying one slice, it's stone cold and it's not even got any cheese on it. And then I'm saying, well, better than nothing, I guess. But jokes aside, who saw us? We want to be seen, really seen. And this is through getting to know families. For most parents, navigating the systems is a job they don't want to be doing. We don't know how to do it and we don't get paid for. So I would like to see more consistency of relationships, clear pathways of support, universal job titles, and that involves trauma informed practice, clear communication practices, because many families, myself included, have experienced huge amounts of distress. And these systems, I'm sorry to say, have played a huge part. So please don't ask me to fill out another checklist. And lastly, this is all time. I could be with my child and I'm not. And time is something we can never get back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eliza, really powerful. And again, I put a link to your um, website Thank in you. the chat as well, so that people can, can share in those, some of those messages. But I think for me, that the, the power of that lived experience is, is so important. So I really appreciate you you sharing your, your amazing illustrations. Um, thank you. And, and, your, and thanks for having me.
not at all. So do stay for the Q and A. Um, so welcome, Michael. Michael Kemp um, is the head of children and young people with additional needs at Rochdale Council. Um, so we're really pleased. Um, we're really aware, Michael. You you're you're poorly today, so thank you so much for still okay. joining us um, and sharing a, a local council's. Um, uh, I guess experience and case studies um, of your integrated work. Thank you very okay. much. So I'm in the really privileged position, if we move on to the next slide, please, of coming towards the end because I can see the links, what everybody said to what I want to share today, which is bringing it really back into line around the family. And what we've been doing in Rochdale is really thinking about resilience and spending time talking to families around that. And what comes up in every conversation we have with our parents is the issue of lack of sleep. Um, we already know uh, from, from research that our children with additional needs are more likely to have um, difficulties with sleep. So, you know, 40 to 86 percent of children with autism have a sleep disorder. And what we know is those problems can be persistent. We also know that sleep difficulties do uh, vary across the spectrum of need. Um, and we also know for some of our ASD children that lack of sleep actually makes the situation worse and it builds. What also families talk to us about is uh, linking right back to what Julie said at the beginning is the issue that lack of sleep causes all sorts of issues around stress within the family, leads to family breakdown, can impact on employment, which then Im impacts on income, which then links us into the whole issue of poverty. And what we thought was we needed to do something about that. So we move to the next slide, please. So while we know about sleep and our SEND community, we also know there's lots of other types of times that sleep impact. For all of us, the lack of sleep can be dangerous. If you think about lorry drivers or taxi drivers, they are more likely to have road traffic accidents. We know where you are if you're, you're sleeping. We also know that for our adolescent community, sleep becomes an issue. But we also know that stress is a real no-no when it becomes linked to sleep. So we just need to think about our young people who are going through their exam phase, that that is a stressful time which can then feed into the issue of lack of sleep. And if you think about that in terms of a child with SEND, it just adds on to an, uh, the level of difficulty. What may not might not be known by many of us is that the lack of sleep is also linked with uh, obesity and there's huge work around um, the cost of that. We move swiftly on. So if we think about that, what we know from our work, and I'm racing through these slides and you can get all of them to read it all at your leisure, is that we found through talking to our community that if we educate parents and professionals about sleep, at an earlier stage, through good sleep hygiene, we are able to help our children meet their full potential and support families best. So then we move to the next slide. So if you just think, I'm not asking you to do this now, but when you get time, just think about how you feel if you were up last night for 10 minutes, 60 minutes, and, and how that impacts on how you're operating today. Last night, I was on night duty, so I had three hours of interrupted sleep, and that clearly, I feel that today as we sit on this um, call. So we've moved to the next slide. The other thing around SEND we need to think about is safeguarding issues. We have to look at and learn from serious case reviews and our local lessons learned. And also from the sudden and unexpected death, death panels. All of those have raised real issues and concerns around how sleep can impact on families, can cause stress and, and can raise the whole agenda of risk of harm. Um, we also need to think when we're thinking about SEND that disability and complex um, needs, often we minimise the impact of harm because we are justified for other reasons, families have lots of different carers or whatever, um, but we do need to make a nod to the fact that our children are three times more likely to be subject to harm. So within this, we need to take um, an extra view. So we move to the next slide. So what we did in Rochdale is we looked at 
our spend on medication and sleep. And what we found was we were disproportionately high and we didn't really understand why. And we also saw a huge increase in costs for that um, sleep medication. We also found out that sleep medication was given very much at the end of the road and there was very little interventions put in place prior to that. Um, so we were interested to really understand that. So we started to ask for lived experiences and we're going to skip through the next three slides but in the pack there are three two case studies that talk through with yourself for yourself of situations which will be very resonant with yourselves around how sleep can be impactful and this is just a quick table to show here we've got a young child in the middle who is not sleeping at all and regularly doing two or three hours and that was being seen as be, uh, a behaviour issue, but actually it's not just the child and this the child impacts on this is why the family hub is so important, because we had mum who had to give up work, she was um, because of the sleeplessness, she ended up on medication, she ended up with depression, the dad then falls out with mum because they can't cope because of the lack of sleep, so he leaves the family home, so that's another loss, and then the siblings within that family also impacted, so we've got one that had disengaged from school and so forth, so you can see how um, it builds up and why it's so important for us. We move to the next slide. So we started to think about um, sleep and thinking about how we support them. And we saw that families short breaks are usually the things we, we bring in. We say to our families, we said, would you like a short break? Would you like a respite? Would you like overnight care? And the idea was to try and prevent our families needing to come into the care system or even worse, ending up in tier four admissions. Um, but what we thought was this is actually fixing a problem farther down the line and not really thinking about what is needed at the beginning. And through listening to the family stories, it was very clear that it was very simple things that mattered. It was doing the family hygiene or the room hygiene stuff. It was actually creating that space. And what we wanted and have done through our family hubs is ensure our workforce are inquisitive and actually ask about sleep at the earliest opportunity. But they do that in a way that means the family doesn't have to repeat the story. So moving on to the next slide. So what will make the difference? For us, it's actually making sure that the safe sleep messages are understood by all our staff at all levels. And so whenever a pet new parent comes in contact with a professional and they start to be inquisitive about sleep, they're in a place and a position to be able to share information around it, that they are giving consistent and safe messages around what it good sleep is like and that the workforce themselves start thinking about their own sleep needs so they come into work prepared uh, to meet those needs and they come in with a listening ear and what is critical and it comes back to last week is that we do this in a way through the single assessment that we only tell the story once because if you're needing to repeat it it means you're not listening thank you so the next slide is just bringing it back to send support because what we are saying is with our sleep work is that within the family hub we've got send and through talking about sleep we were able to bring in the young carers the short breaks the parenting support the whole range of things knitting together to try and prevent that escalation up to needing that medication if you talk to some of our young people who are on sleep medication their description of how it feels when they're taking that medication um, really, really sharpened my view that we needed to try and prevent needing that um, and trying to find an alternative way forward, but in a way that kept the fun together. So that's where we're up to. My voice is about to go and I'm about to start coughing, so I'll hand back to you, Julie. Oh, you've been an absolute star. I don't know how you managed to do that, but you did it and you did it brilliantly. Thank you. Um, and I, I think, you know, particularly 
looking again, it's about the transferability of some of those examples. And so what it's not about the example itself. It's about what does that mean for you in your planning, yeah. in your local area, for your family yeah. hubs. Um, and I learned so much about sleep yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and, and just link with that, the link, I should have said, it does link to the graduated response, which we obviously now call as ordinary available provision, which is that what we should every family be getting and every family should be getting is decent health advice on sleep at the earliest day to stop it escalating up absolutely well i'm always a terrible timekeeper but it's just been so interesting this morning but so we do have a slightly shortened bit for questions so i'm so sorry um but if i could invite all of our speakers back onto the onto their screens um and i will share the first question that we have here um, so this one, I think, um, for for Margaret and, and Colin. So um, there's a huge concern, obviously, around current socio-political factors um, that, that, that they will further disproportionately impact on families of children with additional needs, which we've talked about um, a lot today. Um, the, the, the question says that they already uh, know that through uh, there's research that disability and poverty coexist. And the question I wondered what your thoughts were, Margaret and Colin, on the economic changes, challenges facing our families. So Margaret, do you want to go first? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I totally agree. And that's why I think those models with the concentric circles um, are really important to consider because actually, you know, what schools can do is, is a lot. Um, and they need to keep getting better at what they do to support families. But, but often some of the policy landscape outside of the school setting is really heavily influencing uh, what we can achieve. And I think we need to look more carefully in this green paper consultation about the actual viability of some of the delivery models and the need to think about, you know, food poverty in the local area, to think about access to um, digital, et cetera. And there are some narratives in, in the green paper that are proposing opportunities there. We really need to get in there quickly and say, it's no good to sort of um, improve things in one corner of the plan and then contradict it in another. So we absolutely need a joined up model and a vision so that the policies align and they're not sitting in silos and contradicting each other. And I think that's what happens a lot in, in good intention, but very little impact if we don't look at a broader lens. Okay, thank you so much, Margaret. Colin, do you want to comment on that? Um I think like poverty is obviously it is a, it is a big step and I think there is a big issue in it but I think with the right support and the right like help in the family hubs I think like in Bristol we're quite lucky like the family hubs have the support there from food banks and all that to help parents on the poverty side of things but I think as a parent is everyone's at I don't think no matter what, we're always going to have this issue of poverty. I don't think that's ever going to go away. It's about trying to learn to change our way of living to help with that, if that makes sense. No, it absolutely does. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, a, a question for Eliza here. Um, and the questioner, um, again, everyone's uh, thanking you all for your, your presentations. Um, but the question wants to know whether the fragmented systems uh, that it says we have to navigate, and you described so well, um, the pug advisory services, etc., cetera, um, that leads to you feeling small, disempowered, tired, and even bullied, how does that impact on your relationships at home or other parent relationships? Well, yeah, I mean, it becomes everything because it takes up so much of your time and it was funny watching the presentation on sleep after because you know it impacts on everything when you are exhausted and trying to navigate these systems um it it's it's a huge amount and i think that's something i think often what's missed with services is things like for example respite so um, where we are no children who fit um, our child's profile would get any respite care because it because we don't we won't fit the criteria for a disability team because it's still seen as very much a physical disability but actually children 
have very, very high complex needs when they have something like PDA. And I know a lot of families at the minute are having to use uh, the police, for example, because social care said there's nothing we can do. So those are the things we need to remember is that often when it's not a physical disability, it does get lost and it's not seen that level of need. And of course, once you put the support in, that level of need can reduce. So it's, you know, it's a preemptive measure, if you like, that can be really important to that. Lovely, thank you, Eliza. And I know in the green paper, it talks a lot around, um, around alternative provision. Um, and certainly you mentioned PDA, we certainly know that in alternative provision, the vast majority um, of those young people, children, young people um, do have social and emotional mental health needs, including sometimes diagnoses of, of autism and PDA. So um, really worth um, you know, unpicking the green paper on that front. Um, question here for you for, uh, for Michael. Um, again, someone really interested in split, uh, sleep impacting on families. Uh, wondering if sleep hygiene can improve the sleep for those children with autism uh, who have low levels of melatonin um, as they were under the impression this is a clinical need that's quite a specific question are you able to answer that at all no no we've we've found that good sleep hygiene absolutely supports most children but it also be, because it actually affects the whole family and it's actually the whole family concept what we find with the sleep hygiene is the most common reason for it not being successful is that parents give up too soon on it and once you've got it you have to do it for good it's not something you just do for a couple of months and leave so it is a long-term commitment but absolutely it does um, uh, work across all our children um, but it's about being creative and think thoughtful around it as well and getting partners to think so it's getting schools to understand how they merge into home life and that how what they do in school affects that sleep and it's actually doing it early enough in the day to pulls through and again it's an you know if i'm a great believer in if you've had a really not bad night at school at uh, home you want that school when you walk through that door to say come on have a cup of tea here's a slice of toast just sit down recover and then you're ready for the next day. because it is it's not just home it is a continuum from school into home tonight Absolutely. And, and certainly if you think about those levels of anxiety as well. And again, family hub teams will be so well placed. It's about the understanding of all of those, um, that, that interconnectedness, really, um, all of those pressures on families and, and the difference that that understanding can make, as well as um, uh, as well having that sort of um, that, that curiosity as well to, to ask and to check uh, and to make sure um, you know without you know without prejudice without making a judgment mm. um Domini, um again uh people really responding warmly to your presentation thank you so much a uh, question asking about um the sort of somali dads as well has your your project been able to uh been predominantly successful with with mums or have you been able to um work with mums and dads yeah, I put in a response, a written response, saying that we are increasingly um, engaging with more dads. Um, and I think the key factor has been inviting them in by phone. Um, we also have a key worker model at the school, which I'm sure a lot of schools have um, for many of our SEND students and, and um, vulnerable students as well for safeguarding reasons. Uh, so, for example, I'm the key worker for a number of Somali students that have SEND. And the, that model, which we started up this, at the beginning of the pandemic, has been incredibly successful in creating that really um, strong relationship between families and schools. So a number of the dads have got my work mobile number and I have theirs um, and they feel more connected to the school that way. They can drop me a text or give me a quick call and I can do the same with them. They recognise my number um, and, you know, they know that that they'll get a response from me as their child's key worker. And that's been uh, a real a way in which we've been able to engage the fathers to come in more. Really helpful, thank you so much. And um, we've got quite a fundamental question here to sort of finish us off as well, um, which is, uh, do family hubs currently exist? Um, uh, we are a SEMH school and really struggle with coordinating specialist services or other services, thinking that we have financial resources 
um, to bring in additional services. Uh, the head and I have been discussing ACES centres being needed in the UK and in our region in particular. Uh, these family hubs sound familiar or similar um, and is there a list of uh, family hubs. So I think in, in the first instance, certainly I would, um, uh, we can certainly point you in the direction of, of our family hub regional coordinators. Um, so I cover the south of England and the east, and then my colleagues cover the north of England um, and the, the, the Midlands as well, as well as London. So depending on where you are, do get in touch with us and we can point you in the direction of, of uh, a, co a coordinator who can put you in touch with your um, local authority. Um, but yes, family hubs are not a statutory policy, um, but they are very much at the heart of the government's sort of um, uh, latest um, uh, policy making. Um, they do tie in very closely with Best Start for Life and, as I mentioned, reducing parental conflict. Uh, and also, you know, they're certainly mentioned within the Green Paper as well, I understand. Um, so they, they're recognising that family hubs can very much make a difference. And they are for families from, from pre-birth right the way through to 19. And in, in the um, if a young person has as send um, is recognised and up to 25 as well. Michael, I don't know if you wanted to comment anything else in relation to that sort of coordination of, of services. Well, I suppose um, it does fit with the locality model working that most local authorities are going to. And I think most local authorities are linking through the, the children's centre network as ways well building it on. So that in the Northwest, there are hub concepts already up and running um, but also we have to think about how it, it links through to things like the Ealing projects and all the other initiatives that are pulling people together. Uh, absolutely thank you very much. Um, is there any comment anybody just wants to, to make into maybe just one one quick hope for family hubs from each of you what you know what would what would could family hubs do that would make a difference uh, to the aspects in which you work? Margaret if I start with you. I think in my um, session I was talking a little bit about that kind of curiosity that graduated approach and, and feeling like teachers we're encouraging teachers and leaders to not feel de-skilled by SEND, to not feel that they need to be an expert in all aspects of special educational needs, but to do as many of you have said and know the child better, value that, you know, recognize that it's important. And I think that that could be something that actually collaboratively working with schools in the local area to understand what that holistic picture looks like better and to be constantly curious um, and surprised by the capacity of young people with special educational needs. That's going to be really important and fundamental, I think, to our collaborative working. Absolutely, having that ambition for them through the family hubs as well. Eliza? Uh, well, actually, we have a, a child now who's thriving in a completely different setting. So I think that for us, that's very uh, apparent once you have a setting that um, does do things differently, how successful things can be. So it's holistic, it's trauma informed. Um, they're real advocates for families. So supporting uh, with all the paperwork, the EHCPs with the local authority. So it can be done. And it's, and it's such a lovely thing to see these environments who really understand the children and work flexibly to what they need, removing the onus from being on that child to change and really adapting that environment to be exactly what that child needs to thrive. And we are seeing it in this little place where all these children have had a tricky time who are all now thriving. So that's a lovely thing to be able to see and for our child as well to be experiencing that now. So. Lovely. I'm so, so sorry, because I'm going to have to cut the, the other three of you short. Um, but if you if you want to pop into the chat, what your your one hope for Family Hubs um, and supporting families with SEND would be. Um, but it's been really, really great to, to have you all here this morning sharing your experience. But we are coming up to 12.30. Thank you for taking the time this morning to join us. Uh, and thank you to all of our speakers once more. And to our training team who have ensured everything has run smoothly this morning, apart from my slightly wobbly start. Apologies. You'll receive the slides and a follow-up survey by email after the event. We welcome your feedback about what's helpful and how we can improve these events. Do take a look at the module in our implementation toolkit and you'll uh, notice that the link is there in the chat. 
And we also plan to start developing communities of practice to bring together those developing family hubs with a specific interest in SEND. And this is something that I really want to be spending time on. And, and I see these, these communities of practice as, as, as being sort of probably multiple um, because it's such a huge subject area. So, so we will be sending you more information on that. If you're on our, um, uh, our um, email list, that's, that's brilliant. We'll let you know more about that in our newsletters. So if you are interested in joining this group, please do get in touch um, and we'll share our email address in the chat now. Um, so email us at National Centre for Family Hubs Inquiries, ncfhinquiries at anafroid.org. Um, and just a reminder that you can book onto our upcoming learning events via our website, the Adaptive Mentalisation Based Integrative Treatment, AMBIT and Whole Family Working uh, Bite Size Training on the 19th of May, London Community Practice Gathering on the 21st of June, National Centre for Family Hubs Conference, co-producing accessible and inclusive family hubs on the 7th of July. And do sign up to our Family Hubs In Mind Learning Network to receive our newsletter where we will share details of future events and resources. Thank you again. That little buzz says it's all over. Thank you very much and I hope to see you all again soon. Very much, thank you very much to everybody for your time this morning.